I will be sending you a link to a specific news flash. I thought it was really relevant. We were talking about systems security, right? And in our second module, we are asking the question from, from our last session, we reviewed something about the use of glue or epoxy, that there are Velcro power cord straps, there are laptop and security ports uh, on systems. We'll talk about QR codes in a moment. We talked about UPS and generators and one of the student learning objectives is to be able to explain, okay, what do all of these have in common, right? And uh, before we get to that, what I wanna do though is take just a brief moment to look at this. So uh, I'm not sure why that, so if we can go back. Okay, it was just on there. I guess I'll click the link in the email. All right, can everybody hear the? Yes. Yes. Good. In the United States and Canada, we do provide you know, a highly reliable electrical system. But that being said, the grid is susceptible to cyber and physical security risks. So physical attacks. And there are other types of attacks. When you look at the volume, and the pace, the complexity of all those cyber threats, and understanding how they could potentially impact the grid, uh, that's a tough, tough thing to keep up with. 18 substations and one power plant in Florida, Oregon, Washington, and the Carolinas. The recent incidents have, have identified that these attacks, have, first of all, they've occurred in different parts of the country doesn't necessarily seem to be a rhyme or reason regarding where they occurred, more what the, the attacker wants to do. I, I think that could happen any place where there's an access that, that could be compromised. All right. So if you don't have power, you don't have availability. But I wanted to I wanted to revisit our discussion about these common items. And I wanted to share with you some things. I've been sharing some of this in other classes like the forensics class, but um, if you're not, if you don't happen to be in there at the same time, uh, I'll go ahead and in a rare moment, I'm going to afflict my or inflict my image on you. Does anyone know what this is? No. This is a this is a thirty dollar device, basically, um, and with this thirty dollar device, I'm gonna I'm. Gonna, pivot here and we're going to pretend that this Dell computer sitting to the next next to me I'm going to swivel the camera I want you to see how easy it is for me to open this thing okay I'm going to put this down and uh, let's let's move this here so here's a Dell Optiplex I'm going to try to hold this steady so it doesn't make people dizzy what you see here is a simple security port. And it's designed for you to put a padlock, like the kind you'd buy at any hardware store. Okay. And you wouldn't think that that's a big deal, like a padlock, right? But if that padlock's inserted here, I can't do this. And then I can't pull a tab and then pull out 
uh, a new style M.2 or NVMe hard disk. And then I pop that, it's like a stick of gum. I put the NVMe hard disk inside this adapter, slide it, slide it into the case, connect it with a, a USB-C type cable into my laptop over here. And now within five to seven minutes, I can exfiltrate all of the data on your system, right? So- Also, oh, you almost like creating an external passport, like an external USB. Yes, exactly. A very large external USB, only I'm using the victim's hard disk, right? And what could prevent it? A simple padlock on a security port. If that's in there, I cannot open the case. But how many of you knew, and I'm just gonna go ahead and pop this, you know, and by the way, that would have prevented, prevented the Chinese exploit at our national laboratory in Los Alamos. Would have prevented it entirely. Now you would think in a classified, in, a, in an install, a government installation with highly classified stuff going on for research, you would think, what would they do? They would lock this, right? Now, here's the other part. This is a common ThinkPad, right? And, but most every laptop has a security port on it also. If you look, and, and this is a little harder to see, so I'm gonna try to get in on the side. If you look, you can see this little opening right here. And I have another one over here on mine, on my laptop, right here. And if I insert a laptop security cable, which is just like a bicycle cable, so so uh, it's got a little tab there. When that's inserted, I cannot take apart my laptop case. It is for uh, most models the security port is designed so when there's a security cable in there, you can't even remove the back panel or the, the top. You can't, you can't remove the keyboard, you can't remove the top half or the bottom half. The clamshell won't come apart when it's inserted, okay? And, and that's huge, but it gets better, right? So why would you be interested in that? Well. It's too easy to get a hold of hard drives. Here is one laptop model, right? And this is a common brand. I'm not going to tell you which brand. But there is a SATA hard drive, and it's really easy to plug a SATA adapter. You can buy another $29 adapter that plugs into the back of this SATA disk, and the front side of the adapter is a USB 3.0, right? What you see here is that part of the laptop case is actually actually um, built onto the end of this hard disk. It's a little enclosure and there is a single screw. And if you pull the screw uh, on one of these, basically all you do is remove a single screw right where the black corner is on the bottom of the laptop and, the, and then you pull, you tug on that side of the laptop and this whole tray just slides out and there it is, right? So it's very convenient for maintenance, but the problem is, is that it's not very convenient, you know, in terms of, so there are some cases where even if the security cable is in there and you can't remove the entire back panel, there are some models where, you know, this is, this is an issue, right? And, and, and simple things can help thwart a theft. This is a great example of another accessory that comes with most laptop cables. So it's, it's just, a, there's sticky stuff on the bottom, but, but if you were on the road or you were working in a, a temporary place, you could, you could, of course there are screw holes so you can make it permanent, but you can loop your security cable through that so that they can't run out of the building with it. And 
let's be honest, you could use any large piece of furniture where you loop the security cable under the leg, where there's a gap. There, there are ways you can wrap a security cable so that somebody can't just grab it and run off with it, okay? So how do you, how do you respond to that student learning objective? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my stuff again. And uh, I won't, um, I won't subject you to that. How do you speak to this student learning objective? What do these all have in common? These are all very low cost, very simple, but physical remedies for very serious security breaches. In each one of these cases, you have a huge problem where it's a simple physical remedy. You can put a, a, a big chunk of glue in the front of a USB port or, um, you know, and then you can use the security port. So even if they open up the case, they can't insert the, the little connector and connect a USB inside there. The Velcro straps on the back of the server, we showed you that, yes? Now there's a power cord connection, a second connection on the back of a server. And there's a little Velcro strap you can wrap around there so it doesn't work loose. What about Q codes? QR codes or Q codes. Did you know The FBI is now warning that hackers are taking advantage of QR codes or Q codes, depending on where you're from. And does everybody know what a QR code is? Yeah. You know, you can create QR codes with uh, like an Apple device, right? You can use an iPhone or an iPad. You can go to a website or an online resource. And then if you go into the sharing option, the, the three dot ellipse, and you click on sharing, you can actually create a Q code for that, right? Now, what are we saying? Wherever you see Q codes, you want to do a little homework. And the simple truth is you can use Q codes to your advantage as well. If you want to make sure that people aren't clicking on a link in an email, but you're in a physical environment, you can um, set up a Q code where you know the destination, the system that they're going to connect to. And so you can actually 3D print a Q code. My son does this, and he works in cybersecurity. He takes a 3D printer, he posts the plastic plaque in a physical break room, right? So when people are connecting to resources, all they have to do is point their phone or their tablet at that thing and they click and he knows exactly where they're going. And it's not like uh, a hacker or a malicious ac actor, right? can embed links that are malicious. So you can control the dialogue. You can use QR, it doesn't cost anything, right? You, you can use the simple features to create QR codes. Um, I won't say that 3D printing it isn't, isn't gonna cost something. I think it costs him all of 20 cents of filament to 3D print a QR code that cannot be changed or altered. It is a physical object. And then he puts it on the wall in the break room and people blink away at it all day long. And everybody has peace of mind because they know they're not being exploited by folks who are now, instead of links, they're sending QR codes, right? So you, you got to keep you got to keep with it. These are low cost or no cost methods. What they all have in common is that they are all low cost or no cost methods that defeat, defeat hacking methods because they break 
a link in the kill chain, right? So a hacker has a specific set of steps they take. And if just one of the links is broken, just one, right? Just lock the computer case. And then the Chinese researcher, who's really an, a secret agent and a spy that wants to steal US military secrets about nuclear weapons from Los Alamos, right? They don't get a chance to do that because, well, they got to bring in a bolt cutter. And if they walk through the front door and there's a high security area, then they have to go through the scanning booth, just like you do at the airport. And of course, the alarm goes off. And what are you doing with the bolt cutters, right? So how much does it cost to buy a padlock at Superdollar? What's the cost of a padlock at Superdollar? Anybody? Probably a couple dollars. Right. Which gets to our other student learning objective. It's like relate the danger that embedded marketing features in an application. We're talking about QR codes, right? Outdated certificates, poorly worded wizards. When you connect to a new network source, there's a poorly worded wizard that pops up that says, hey, do you want other devices to, do you want your device to be discovered by other connected systems in the network? And because of the way it's worded, it's highlighted on the yes, and most users just click, they just hit enter. And oh, now they're discoverable, right? That's a poorly worded wizard. That's another example. So when you're looking at how to improve security, there is, there is a simple process where you, and, and again, these are not so obvious, right? Low cost, but not so obvious opportunities to tighten down with users and with hardware and with software, okay? Users, hardware, and software. That's the whole point of our objective. We're looking at the different components of a system, the users, well, I'm sorry, the users is the next module, the hardware, software, and services, okay? Hardware, software, and services. So one way you can lock down um, Services. So I, I was talking about Q codes. The Q code that my son set up, one of the QR codes that my son set up and printed connected the Wi Fi for wireless devices automatically. What am I saying? A Q code can include all sorts of information. And you can embed in the Q code the, the SSID of a hidden Wi-Fi network, a secured Wi-Fi network that can be hidden. It's not advertised. The code it takes, the secret, the shared secret it takes to connect and all of the, you can, you can also embed uh, specifics about the network connectivity. So, you can specify things like, okay, where are you getting, where are you getting your DNS from? So that one physical Q code, users take their smartphones and their tablets, they they take a picture of that thing, and and then they're connected to a secure network automatically, and their DNS is set automatically, so they can't be hijacked. They can't be redirected when they're clicking on links. You know, these are these are very low cost, simple methods for making sure that you know your system has confidentiality, it has integrity, or it has availability. I'm going to keep coming back to UPSs and generators all the time because of what we just watched on screen with the threat of you know attacks on the power grid, right? Um, what we're going to do next is take a look at section material in section 5.8 of the textbook. We want to discuss the special security challenges and recommend controls for databases and data centers. Okay. Can everyone still see my screen? Uh, let me guess. You haven't been seeing my screen for a while. Yes. Oh, you got to say something. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. 
Okay, yes. sorry about that. Yeah, I was pointing some stuff on the screen while I was talking and gesturing on the screen. And I apologize, you didn't see that for the last couple of minutes. Uh, so the QR codes, um, yeah, you print them and they're physical and they're made out of plastic and they can't be modified or changed. And, and that's helpful. Okay, so data centers, right? Uh, we were talking about how all the eggs are in one basket. Um, did we already look at this? I think we already looked at this. Command trap. Yeah, I think we already looked at this. My, my apologies. Um, has anyone seen, let's do this. Has anyone seen the use of a man trap on island? No. Okay, does anybody go to the bank? Yes. Okay, does anybody use Banco Popular? So a man trap is basically a cage and in sunny over toward um, Williams Delight on St. Croix. Does anybody live West End over by Kmart? Basically, it's a small cage, right? So at the, at the front of the Banco Popular branch on the West End of this island, when you enter the bank, who greets you? A security guard, right? Yes. And they hit a buzzer and then you come in, right? And then he turns around and he looks to see how many people are in the branch, right? So why would that be an issue? Well, in terms of physical security, if there are too many people in the lobby and then more people are coming in, the chances of a bank robbery are much higher. But if basically the security guard waits until a couple of people leave, then he hits another buzzer and the other door opens. And now the person who was waiting in the man cage can leave. Now, if you're a bank robber in a hurry to exit, having to wait to get through a cage to get out would, would be a, that would be a problem, okay? And so that's what we mean by man trap. Right, so man traps are physical security portals that can include sensors. True story, I had a cybersecurity intern who tried to sneak a digital camera into a nuclear facility. This happened about 10 years ago. We were touring a nuclear facility with the Department of Energy. We stopped three times on the way to the nuclear facility. In all three cases, somebody said, did you remove all your keys, all recording devices, all photographic equipment, any cameras? Do you have any thumb drives, USB drives? Do you have any form of data media whatsoever? Do you have any uh, materials with which to take notes? You have to empty your pockets. You can't have anything, right? Three different times. Then we got to the nuclear facility and what did they have right in front? A man cage. And inside the man cage was a scanner like the one at the airport. And it lit up like a Christmas tree. And the kunumunu that entered that booth basically had a camera in his paint. He had painter's pants. Said, oh, oh, I forgot. I, I forgot. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had a camera in there. It didn't, it didn't go well for him, right? So that's how you catch people. You have these kinds of setups when there's all that cheddar, all that information in one room, you wanna take extra measures. Um, we're gonna go on to uh, chapter 16 and start reviewing information about chapter 16 in our textbook. So yeah, Banco Popular at some of their branches, they have a man cage. And the other banks, I think they have a security guard and they only let so many people in, right? Have you, have you been to a bank branch lately? Is, is that your experience also? Yes, no, maybe? No. 
No, you haven't experienced that. Okay. Well, I'm not going to ask you which bank you go to. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. So uh, physical security and infrastructure, right? Uh, the basis of all cybersecurity is physical security. That's something we've already established. Uh, a big portion of physical security is control over the premises. So what can often happen is that a hacker can pose as a like a repairman, and then when they walk down the hall, they can hoist a Wi-Fi router up above the ceiling tile. And they, if, if they know something about the, you know, if they've been in touch with people who have repaired the network, they know how to plug it up real quick. And now they have a rogue Wi-Fi router on the premises. It's actually happened, right? So premises security is, um, you're, you're basically looking at the entire area around the facility and, and around the areas where the data and systems exist. So when you're stopping someone from putting a Wi-Fi router up into the ceiling tile, um, you're, you're not anywhere near the data center. You're not anywhere near the man cage. Um, there doesn't seem to be any interest in controlling the surrounding area, but premise security in terms of physical or geographical, that's the largest category of security, right? And, and it also includes availability issues like fire suppression, fire detection, that kind of stuff. Um, outer security cameras in the parking lot. And then physical security is around the data systems and the software and the access of the of the technical systems itself that's the physical system around there and that's where the laptop locks come into play logical security is when you're using um you're using software and you're using like authentication and such to protect the data so that it can't be stolen or or you're uh, encrypting the data so that somebody who's sniffing the network can't be, um, can't get it. True story, there was a Russian crime ring, uh, organized crime ring, and they were stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from branch, branches, bank branches. And, and the FBI couldn't figure out, okay, how are they doing this? Because when they studied how the banks were hacked, they were hacked in their local Wi-Fi network and nobody could figure out what was going on. What they had done is recruited some people to basically, this was all under a ruse. It had something to do with, um, yeah, we uh, study bank security in Russia and we'd like to know uh, you know, how these banks do. And so all we want you to do is to put this little black box in your purse and, and visit the bank and ask for a loan and spend 10 minutes in the bank. That's all. And the first couple of times they were lured into doing this, uh, there wasn't anything associated with the black box, but, but they got paid. They, they got a prepaid credit card with $500 on it. And, and, they, and then they were rewarded. They said, thank you so much. Uh, you know, when, when you uh, went to the bank, we were able to determine some exposures that we see in Russia that we don't see in America. And, and this is so good. This is so, uh, and, and actually, I think the Russians were actually posing as Hungarian or Romanian or Bulgarian. They weren't, they weren't telling people they were actually Russians. They were they were telling well I'm I'm from Eastern Europe and um, and so you know uh, we must be careful in Eastern Europe and so uh, but but you can help us and and make lots of money and everybody is happy right so they did a very good job of explaining all this we're going to get into more detail about social engineering and uh, social engineering is uh, that, that 
has one aspect of exposure, but in that scenario, what, what a simple thing that could happen that would protect against communication-based threats is that you simply reduce the number of network addresses allowed on a Wi-Fi network. So when uninvited guests show up and they're trying to get on your Wi-Fi, they can't. That would be a good example of a logical security measure that or control that it has to do with the tech and how it's configured so that it's it's not physical, right? It's not a lock or something. Any questions about the different types of, of uh, physical and infrastructure security? So a lot of the detail in the slides about physical security is, is common sense. So you always have to have two requirements for physical security to work, right? Uh, it, physical security has to be able to prevent damage to the infrastructure and or misuse of the infrastructure that leads to misuse and damage of protected information. So either damage or misuse, right? So maybe they don't get at the data, but they vandalize the equipment and then people can't use it anyway, right? When you look at physical security threats, technically speaking, uh, the author classifies those in three broad categories, environmental threats. Um, if you have to have a data center that has 500 servers, you have a place in one location that gets very hot. And if you don't have AC, uh, the servers can overheat very quickly technical threats and human caused threats. And they'll, they'll basically take some time to explain each of those, right? So these are environmental uh, risks. These are environmental exposures that can cause all sorts of uh, damage to technology systems. That's pretty self-explanatory. I think we saw a slide somewhat like this in chapter one, didn't we? We were looking at at uh, essentials. And the one thing you should know is that like category five hurricanes, the higher the F scale, Fujitsu, Fujita scale, not Fujitsu, Fujita scale for a tornado, the, the worse it gets, right? So you can even get concrete houses that are lifted off their foundations uh, there have been cases of, uh, you know, um, uh, a piece of straw that's uh, driven through a telephone pole, stuff like that, when, when speeds get that high. And yeah, this is something we're intimately familiar with. We don't need to spend a lot of time on this. However, uh, the temperature stuff there is a certain threshold of temperature that actually destroys paper records. Does anyone know what the magic uh, Fahrenheit number is in degrees that where paper will burst into flames spontaneously? Does anyone know what it is? Four fifty one. It's actually the title of a book, Fahrenheit four fifty one. At four hundred and fifty one degrees. Fahrenheit paper products will spontaneously burst into flames. But but they'll they'll get pretty bad very quickly with just 350 degrees. They'll start to brown, the, you won't be able to read them anymore, that kind of thing. Plastic starts to uh, deform and create hazardous conditions because uh, plastic is used to insulate wires, and then if the plastic melts, then the wires touch and it shorts out. So at 257 degrees, computer equipment can fry at 175 degrees. Hard disk media ruins at 150 degrees. CDs and CDs and DVDs can uh, be destroyed in 120 degrees. Um, one fun thing to do with a CD or a DVD is to stick it in a microwave. You don't you don't want to do this with a microwave you prepare food in. But 
in organizations where they have to destroy DVD and CD data, they have a old microwave they use. And if you put it in there, it, it's, it's, it's like fireworks. It's pretty interesting. Uh, it doesn't burst into flames though. You can expose flexible disks and magnetic tapes to magnets or to a hundred, just a hundred degrees. Question, does the dashboard or console of your car ever exceed a hundred degrees? Hello? No, I don't think so. Actually, in the sunshine, it, it, it really does. Uh, um, have you ever heard the have you ever heard the thing that you shouldn't keep a baby in a, a car? Yes. You, you wouldn't want to put an infant in a car with the windows rolled up because it gets hot. That's because the sunshine hits the dashboard and the console and it, it starts to catch the heat and it, it builds up and builds up. It gets way over a hundred degrees very fast. So this, this is also true for USB media and for uh, solid state hard drives. After a certain temperature point, USBs and solid state hard drives will fry and, and you can lose the data on there. Another thing that happens with environmental damage has anyone ever forgotten they had a USB in their pocket and it goes through the washing machine? Yeah, that that's an obvious environmental hazard. Laundry. Laundry can destroy data. It's not something you'd think about, but you know, that's another thing to think about. Uh, yeah, so talks about uh, the time relation used for testing the structure of buildings. If the building collapses and it destroys your stuff, then, then your data is destroyed just the same. So, so these are obvious, um, but also not so obvious, right? When, when you're preparing to secure data and you're concerned about availability or integrity, Temperature can muck with the content of the data, even if the data survives, it's been corrupted because the ones and zeros can get warped by the temperature. So what are we saying? The integrity of the data can be ruined even if it isn't physically destroyed. And so, I mean, certainly availability is, is um, part of that too. Water damage. So did you know that a fire suppression system can actually destroy a data center? So there, there are cases where they have no, no lie. They decide to put a data center in a big room where they have sprinklers, like water sprinklers. And those are accidentally set off and it pours through the servers like a waterfall trickling down from level to level to level. I've actually been in a room where that's happened and it, it, um, the power was still live and, and it was not a, a, not a pretty sight. So, uh, you can have cold that bursts a pipe and then afterwards there's a thaw. So that can cause problems, but electrical danger is probably the worst. Uh, this is something to note in the Southeastern United States, um, in the lower corner of South Carolina down to the cent center of Florida, there are more lightning strikes per square mile than anywhere else in the Western Hemisphere, North America and South America. Now, there are exceptions. There are mountaintops that get zapped all the time. I'm just talking about general places where, you know, the average acre or average square mile humans live. We don't have very many lightning storms here, but when we do, they're close and they're powerful, right? So has anyone experienced uh, damage from a lightning bolt to their technology or their electronic devices in their home? Has anyone ever experienced that? No. Here in the territory? It is, it is pretty rare. 
it's more that it's more that WAPA's inconsistency with the power grid would cause would cause more problems. Radiological and biological hazards. Uh, in our computer architecture course, we we teach that there are certain BIOS chips that can be erased with black light. So there are some electronic components that can be damaged with UV light or black light. Of course, um, what usually happens with a flood is that there's lots of extra contaminants in the flood water, and that poses a chemical and biological hazard. All right, so I'm gonna make this simple for everyone. There are probably 20 more slides that are gonna talk about environmental hazards or 10 more slides about environmental hazards. But if you can remember heat and dust, dust is a problem because when the components of a digital device are covered in dust, it can't shed the heat. So, if heat by itself is a problem, uh, electronic devices can cook themselves if they're dirty, if there's dust. So it's a good idea to, you wouldn't think about it again, but uh, like a spring cleaning, you take the cases of your laptops apart and your PCs and you get compressed air and you take it outside. Why wouldn't you why wouldn't you use compressed air on the dust inside? What happens to the dust inside? Where does it go? Would it shock you to learn that it goes right back into the same computer system? If you're indoors and there are closed windows and doors, a lot of people dust their technology devices indoors and then the AC units recirculate them, and yeah, the filters are supposed to catch them, but really fine dust doesn't work that way. Should take it outside and then uh, use compressed air outside. The main problem with dust is that when it's coating components, the components get too warm and then they overheat. So heat is the number one thing. Dust is the number two thing because dust makes them overheat themselves and water would be the third, okay? Technical threats. Have you ever heard of a neutron bomb? Has anyone ever heard of a neutron bomb? Or has anyone ever seen the James Bond movie called Golden Eye? No. Okay, uh, if you have an electromagnetic field, if you have a huge release of energy, what's often associated with a huge release of energy, like a nuclear detonation, they have a special kind of nuclear bomb. It's called a neutron bomb. And when a neutron bomb is detonated, it's a huge release of energy that creates a massive electromagnetic field that electromagnetic field causes power surges in the wires and circuits, and it fries the circuits. So that is a serious threat. And on that note, what I'll do is we'll take just a moment here to show you this here. So here's a quick here's a quick YouTube about what it is and how it works. This looks like a very short one. So there's a nuclear weapon that's designed. So while the phones are ringing off the hook tonight, this is a very interesting topic. Do you think that using a neutron bomb is that a moral issue? Because Sam Cohen he talks about how he felt that it was a moral weapon to use this on somebody else. Drones are the way to go, Michael. 
Maybe I could. Maybe I could. Maybe I could. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we have another caller. Well, thank you. Thank you for calling. I think that it's a moral issue, the neutron bomb. I'm, I'm stuck on this moral issue. We have a call on line. This is uh, Jim from Orange County. Hi. Are you familiar with the effects of a neutron bomb? And it's not just, we're not just talking about an immediate death. This is horrific. So a neutron bomb has lots of radiation, but what it does is it pulses. There's a huge pulse of EMI and basically it fries all the circuits. And why would you do that? Uh, that's the primary, that's the primary effect. It's a neutron bomb is designed to blast an area with radiation to kill the people and to fry all the electronics so that they can't resist you. And then you just come over, you just come in and take over the buildings. So he was talking about a moral issue. Um, the nation, the world's superpowers have uh, versions of this weapon. And basically, its intent is to clear out an area so you can come in and take over. And so, when they talk about a, they talk about a moral, uh, moral nightmare. That's that's kind of a, uh, uh, worst case scenario. In any case, there are cases where EMI occurs naturally, where it can fry your computers. And it's important to understand that, in some in some places, you want to shield the equipment inside a metal cage. That's that's the workaround. All right, we're going to stop here, and we'll finish our review of uh, hardware, software, and service security controls, the things we can do to secure hardware, software, and services. We'll, we'll uh, pick up on Friday. Any Given the information and the detail that was just shared, can anyone think of some questions or comments you'd like to share with others? Okay. Well, please remember that today is the last day you can complete your reconciliation of the Module 1 assessment. If you haven't done that yet, please do that. All right.